God of the covenant. In the mystery of the cross, you promise everlasting life to the world. Gather all people into your arms and shelter us with your mercy that we may rejoice in the life we share in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Glory and praise. Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finished my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Did you hear those readings? Get a load of those characters? We've got an old codger and his over-the-hill wife longing for a child. A fiery missionary writing letters from jail. And a young rabbi with a price on his head bad-mouthing the king. It's some company we keep. If you happen to think that faith is the stuff of nice, reserved people who quietly mind their own business, take another look. God has Abraham and Sarah thinking outside the box, with many, I'm sure, thinking they're out of their minds. At age 75, the Lord called them to leave a stable, comfy home for who knows where. Like Airstream retirees, off they go, except I don't think Airstreams come equipped with nurseries. God promises them descendants at the age of 75. And by the time they're 90, they're still not parents. We heard Abram's chutzpah today, questioning the Lord, pressing him for a sign that that promise will be kept. In that Give and take, we find that doubt is not the opposite of faith as something. Rather, it is a lively, growing edge of faith. Doubt presses God for more information, for greater evidence. So God invites Abram outside to take a look up at the starry sky. He says, count them if you can. That's how many descendants you're going to have. And that night in a strange dream or a vision, or maybe it was for real, whatever, God established a covenant with Abram that very night. 
But still it wasn't until Abraham was 99, with Sarah close behind and biological clocks long kaput, not until the age of 99 does bouncing, Abraham, does bouncing baby Isaac come along. Story one. And then there's Paul. Follow Paul's journeys on a Bible map and you get a sense of how frenetic he must have been, capital A achiever. He had gone all over the known world, establishing churches, challenging the establishment, suffering shipwrecks and hunger, imprisonment, ridicule, his mysterious thorn in the flesh, as he calls it. Next to Jesus, I think it's fair to say that no other human being has had a more profound effect on the lives of so many both Jew and Roman citizen, he rattled the cages of religion and politics, and he was finally executed for it. Story three, lastly, we encounter Jesus on his way to Jerusalem for his death. He begins that journey at the end of chapter nine in Luke, and the trip takes the rest of the gospel, more than half the book. In spite of threats and warnings about Jerusalem, Jesus is determined to follow through with God's plan. In today's poignant scene, he calls King Herod a fox, not meant to be a compliment, and then depicts himself as mother hen facing that fox, wishing to gather her chicks and protect them. But those chicks reject the mother hen and so Jesus weeps over the fate of dear Jerusalem. Abram and Sarah, Paul, Jesus, they're separated by the centuries from each other and, of course, from us. And yet, I hope you see those intriguing connections which might even be compelling for us. First of all is the issue of where faith comes from. In each instance, you see, faith is not something they produce for themselves. Faith always comes as gift from God. As Luther reminds us in his small catechism, I cannot by my own reason or understanding believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. Rather, it is the Holy Spirit who calls me through the gospel, enlightens me with his gifts, and sanctifies and keeps me in the one true faith. Faith is a gift of God. I mean, consider, how is it possible that Abraham and Sarah could believe that they would bear a child? Not because of biological likelihood, not because of romantic activities. Remember, Sarah laughs at the thought of it. And when Isaac is finally born, he is named that because that name means laughter. Abram and Sarah become nomads in writer Frederick Beekner's description with one foot in the grave and the other in the nursery because God made them a promise. Unlikely, unreasonable, some might think it unfortunate, but that promise grabs them, takes hold of them, creates the faith, and keeps them moving forward. They don't give a fig what others think, because it is the Lord God who writes their script. God is their focus. God is their strength. God is their goal, no matter the odds against it. That's the same for St. Paul, of course. His life as an esteemed Pharisee and supreme persecutor of Christians, Christians is completely undone as the risen Lord channels his zeal and energy in the exact opposite direction, no longer persecuting, now establishing churches, building up Christ's body. It's only by God that faith could make that kind of change. With the might of Rome breathing down his neck, it is only by God's grace that what he planted could so sprout and grow dramatically all over the empire. Jesus was right about the power of the seed, about the growth of the yeast. So even in that dank prison cell, 
Paul is able to write these incomparable words of trust and hope. Did you hear it? Our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior. It's reminiscent of Abraham's stargazing. It's reflected in the powerful spirituals of American slaves and in the freedom songs of South African blacks under apartheid. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. How's that for hope? They're in prison. Paul holds fast to the example and promise of Christ, and he calls on his readers, his listeners, to do the same. Facing humiliation and defeat, Jesus is not deterred from that road in front of him. Herod's threats, in fact, seem to embolden him. Today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on the way, my way. Tell the fox that. The powers, the plans, the politics of the day don't intimidate him in the least because he trusts that God's word will ultimately determine what takes place and what will endure. Rome's armies and Roman authority may be the mightiest in the world, but Jesus trusts they will not have the last word. In all of those readings today, notice that faith is more than just belief in a certain set of propositions. Faith is rather a way of life that goes when it has a God's eye view of the world. In spite of all the threats, obstacles, and an unlikelihood the world can dish out, faith, trust, holds on to the one who can accomplish what he promises. That means that faith is more than just a quiet sort of feeling that helps me get by from day to day. Faith is rather a frontal attack on the old to make way for God's new Faith becomes the resolve to live by what will be rather than to be held back by what is or what has been. Do you see the difference that makes? Abram and Sarah left comfort and security behind. Paul's life was completely turned around. Jesus challenged the mightiest powers on earth, even death itself, for the sake of God's promises. Faith means being drawn into something far greater than ourselves, far beyond human capacity, into what God will provide. So Abraham and Sarah become aliens in a strange new world. Well into their 90s, they find themselves thinking about babies' names and grandkids, maybe. Paul talks about having a heavenly citizenship while grappling with the reality of earthly power. From that bleak cell, he can write about love and peace and hope in Christ. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are all about ushering in God's order and rule for the world. The worst that the world has to offer death itself is no match for the power of God's love. In our own day, when the issues of aliens and citizenship and the relationship between faith and politics are always in front of us, these witnesses clue us in to the difference that faith can make for us in this time and place. Those early Christians saw themselves as resident aliens. They were people of God who were in this world, but not of this world. They knew that they marched to a different beat from music, from a different place. I think that lays on us a really important question. Who or what provides the beat for our lives? Who or what 
is the compass that sets the course that we take. I mean, is it the vagaries of Wall Street that determines the choices of our lives? Is it the occupant of the White House or the members of Congress who set our stage? I mean, does a medical report have the power to undo us? Can the loss of a loved one crumble the foundation beneath our feet? Or can faith bring us to see beyond those things to a reality, to an author, judge, ruler, savior, who is in control and whose promises hold sway? Did you catch the message of that marvelous Psalm 27 as it's sung for thousands of years now? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? My heart speaks your message. Seek my face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. brings to my mind today's gospel image of that mother hen, wings spread, offering herself, giving her all, risking her life for the sake of those she loves. It's an amazing maternal image of Jesus, arms outstretched to embrace, to give life and love even to those who have rejected him. Our mission as a faith-filled people and a faith-filled church, is to witness to the reality of God's power and promise above all others in the way that we live our lives and spend our time and money in the activities and ministries of this congregation, in all things, really, to show our true citizenship, that it's beyond Reading, Pennsylvania, United States, Earth, that we belong to God. We are the heirs of God's kingdom. In countless ways, you and I are called to demonstrate, to bear witness to that truth, to be people of welcome, especially to the stranger, to be people of trust who are willing to risk, to be people of hope even as we face the most dismal situations. All of this, and who knows how much more is possible, only when our hearts are tied to what by God will be. And so we've got these two wizened nomads, this persistent jailbird, this rabbi on death row. I know that to some that assemblage must sound awful. But seen with the eyes of faith, they're really quite awesome. From God's perspective, you and I are in splendid company. Thanks be to God. Living together in trust and hope, let us boldly profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son of the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
turning to the Lord with all our heart, let us pray for the whole people of God, the earth, and all who cry out for healing. Please kneel or be seated. Give to your church vigor and renewal, even as we listen to the word of the prophets and pray for those persecuted for their faith. We pray for our covenant congregation, Christ Episcopal Church, and for Father John, for the people of Incarnation Lutheran Church, and for the congregation and staff of Faith Lutheran Church in Mount Penn. Hear us, O God. Grant peace to the city of Jerusalem to the people of Israel and Palestine and throughout the Middle East, that the land of Abraham and Sarah, Jesus, Paul, and Mohammed may remain blessed and holy. Hear us, O God. And fold with compassion all who cry out for peace of mind and healing, especially Randall Wolf, Jan Rita Clemison, Nan Pottiger, Bill Davidson, Brian Trupp, Andrea Ramsey, Joanne Culp, Joan Hinkle, Kirsten Irwin, Pat Livenspire, Linda Maggio, Carol Batdorf, Andrew Wasmuth, our homebound, our homebound members, and those others we name. Hear us, O oh God. Form us in these Lenten days to be a people marked by gratitude and generosity, sharing the abundance of your grace and love. Hear us, O God. As a hen gathers her brood under her wings, draw us with all the saints to your tender and merciful embrace. Bless and protect our sisters and brothers whom we remember in prayer this week. Kirsten Lefevre, Carl and Betty Leufen, Jane Levan, Stephen Levan, and Bill Levan. Hear us, O oh God. Hear us according to your steadfast love, O oh God. And in your great compassion, bring us to resurrection and rebirth in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace, remember the poor.